What is feminism? Bell Hooks describes it as the movement to end sexist oppression. However, feminism is not widely understood as a complex and serious political movement due to the lack of knowledge about its diverse nature. Most people would have a difficult time connecting it to their lives and experiences. There were three major waves of feminism, with the first occurring in the 1920s. This era of feminism is marked by women winning the right to vote, the right to education and property, and working outside the home. The second wave of feminism, which occurred during the 1960s and 70s, is marked by the struggle for reproductive and abortion rights, equal pay, and ending sexual harassment in the workplace. Finally, the third wave of feminism occurs today, with this wave being characterized by battling rape culture, ending slut-shaming, and briefly addressing racial injustice. A reoccurring theme among all three waves is that the issues of white, mostly middle-class women are being represented. The social construction of femininity is done so through many institutions, including the, me the medical institution, psychological institution, advertising, schools, and entertainment. Beauty culture also reinforces what the ideal women should look like. All these institutions exclude women of color and their experiences, which are white women. There are three prominent variations of feminism today, bourgeois feminism, liberal feminism, and radical feminism. While bourgeois feminism is described as non-intersectional feminism, meaning that only the concerns of upper-class white women are important, liberal and radical feminism tend to be more inclusive. The difference between liberal feminism and radical feminism is that liberals are willing to work within the already existing systems and structures to achieve equality, while radicals are willing to get rid of the oppressive system altogether. Liberal feminism tends to be less intersectional than that of radical feminism. Lack of intersectionality in the women's movement is prominent. The first passage discussed is called La Guerra by Sherry Moraga. Sherry Moraga was born to a Mexican Chicana mother and a white Anglo father, and all throughout her life she has passed as white. She describes her upbringing as being whitewashed. She believes her mother anglicized her and her siblings because she associated Chicana with being less, and to her passing as much as possible as a white woman would guarantee her a better life. At a later age, Moraga came out as a lesbian to her family, and that is when she began to understand the experiences of her mother as a Chicano woman, because being a lesbian forced her to confront the different ways that she was oppressed that were unique to her being a lesbian. This helped her open up dialogue on intersectionality in the women's movement. The lack of dialogue about intersectional oppression beyond a theoretical framework is shallow and will not build connections among oppressed groups. To not do so would isolate an individual into thinking about different oppressions separately and would create conflicting attitudes towards identities. This is described perfectly in Sherry Moraga's quote on page 24 of the book. Oppression comes through class and culture. Although feminism is advertised as an all-women's movement, a trend in the women's movement is to use the voice of middle-class white women to speak for all women. Moraga had a moment when she realized that she had denied the voice of her brown mother, the brown in her, in her work. Part of the unconscious effort that made that possible was her socialization into associating darkness and female with evil, a form of internalized oppression. Dismissal of Racism in the White Women's Feminism Some white women in the movement do not acknowledge racism and oppression in the women's movement, and Moraga discusses that these women feel no loss, no lack, no absence when women of color are not involved. Therefore, there is little desire to change the situation. The lack of intersectionality in the women's movement is relevant today. Although most feminists are well-meaning, Women of color are often left out and not prioritized in the women's movement, and their issues are dismissed and seen as not important. There is a phenomenon that is celebrity feminism. Many celebrities use social media as a platform to speak out about feminist issues that do not pertain to women at a larger scale and to women of a lower socioeconomic status. The main issues are dis discussed are freeing the nipple and empowerment through nudity. Not to belittle these efforts, however, most women have larger issues that deal with life or death situations, such as access to health care and education. The takeaway point is that all women should confront this issue to make change, effective change, for all women. 
Colorism is defined as prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone, typically among the people of the same ethnic or racial background. From an early age, children witness this idea through TV shows and commercials and reality, anything in the popular media. From an early age, you are taught that white is beautiful and the lighter skin tone you have, the prettier and more privileged you are. Now, the idea of passing refers to someone whose racial or ethnic background would usually be considered dark skinned. However, they themselves have light enough skin that they are able to pass as white. We see this evident all over the world. The lighter skin you have, despite your racial or ethnic background, you are evidently treated better than someone with darker skin would be. Colorism and the idea of passing is seen through many passages throughout the book, This Bridge Called My Back. All quotes and excerpts I present to you are taken from there. To begin, the poem, On Not Being, by Mary Hope Whitehead Lee, follows a woman on her journey throughout life. She says, no, never once did she want to be white, to pass, dreamed only of being darker, she wanted to be darker. Here, readers get a glimpse that to be lighter is a thing that many people of color may want. However, our narrator of this poem does not want this. They enjoy their color and actually wish they were darker. The ending quote also shows how colorism plays out. It is said, the man she married, because he was the first to ask, her being afraid nobody else would, said he thought he was going to have to marry himself a white because he couldn't find no colored girl was intelligent enough, but with her being the next best thing to white. Although the narrator loves herself the way she is, her husband still looks at her as the next best thing to white more so proving the point that white is looked at as the best option and everything else will never add up. The next passage that presented colorism was entitled Entering the Lives of Others by Theory in the Flesh. In this passage, it is said, a theory in the flesh means one where physical realities of our lives, our skin color, the land or concrete we grew up on, our sexual longings, all fused to create a politic born out of necessity. This passage talks about how all of these assumptions brought upon us are solely politic and arguably a necessity. In our world, there always has to be and always will be someone who, because of any reason, will be better than the next person. That is how society works. We would not be able to function without someone being greater and the next person being lesser. This goes for the idea of colorism as well. I do not believe that society as a whole would be able to function if people were not convinced that a lighter skin tone is more desired than a darker The last passage that really stuck out to me as an example of colorism and the idea of passing is Loella by Sherry Moraga. Throughout this passage, the author talks about how she thought she was going to be better off than her mother solely based on the fact that she was educated. But as time went on, she realized it was not only about education, but it was also about her skin tone. They say, I was educated and wore it with a keen sense of pride and satisfaction. My head propped up with knowledge from my mother that my life would be easier than hers. I was educated, but more than this, I was low weather, fair skinned. The author then goes on to talk about how they understand that traditionally their people were less, but because the author has lighter skin, they have a better guaranteed their future. This is demonstrated by the quote, being Chicana meant less. We became anglicized. The more effectively we could pass in the white world, the better guaranteed our future. As terrible as this idea sounds, it is still a very relevant thing, whether people want to believe it or not. But the one thing that really struck my attention in this passage is the quote, I have internalized a racism and classism, where the object of oppression is not only someone outside of my skin, but the someone inside of my skin. In fact, the real battle with such oppression for all of us begins under the skin. By saying this, the author is showing that the battle begins within every single person. In order to overcome colorism, racism, and any oppression in general, is to have people stop believing that they are lesser than someone else. Yes, there will always be people who believe that they are better than the next person, but if the next person be stops believing they are less, who is really winning that battle? Colorism and the idea of passing is not only just a phenomenon found throughout this reading, it is seen daily throughout the world that we live in today. One recent example of this is the amount of people that turned out to the Women's March. How many of these people were white? Yes, it is great that all of these women turned out for such a great cause, but one quote really stuck out to me with, through the whole entire thing. That being, I hope all of you nice white ladies come out to the next Black Lives Matter protest. With this being said, People are going to support the things that directly affect or benefit themselves. However, when it comes to supporting someone who you may distinguish as lesser based on their skin tone, these people are nowhere to be found. Colorism is important to the feminism movement today because from an early age, little girls and boys for that matter, are taught to believe that white is beautiful and everything darker than that is less beautiful. It is important to note that they are less beautiful and not unattractive because you can have a beautiful woman of color, but according to society, when put up to a beautiful white woman, the white woman will always be considered more beautiful. Hooks defines the feminist movement as a movement to end sexist oppression. With this in mind, colorism plays a major role by pointing out that not only are women lesser than men, but that can be broken down even further to say that women of color are less than white women, therefore being oppressed even more. 
The invisibility of women of color in the feminist movement has been a problem since its inception all the way until the modern day. The problem stems mainly from a lack of intersectionality both in the actions taken by feminists as well as by the sidelining of the work and leadership of women of color in the feminist movement. The problem is also related to the way society views feminists and the fact that it has a stereotypical view of what a feminist is. Society tends to picture feminists as middle to upper middle class white women with a college degree in women's studies. The view both makes society ignore feminists of color as well as not even have the expectation that a woman of color could be a feminist. When Mitsuo Yamada filed an academic due process grievance against her employer, they reacted with shock. They said, we don't understand this. This is so uncharacteristic of her. She seems such a nice person, so polite, so obedient, so non-troublemaking. What was even more surprising was once they were forced to acknowledge that I was determined to start the due process action, they assumed I was not doing it on my own. One of the administrators suggested someone would have pushed me into this, undoubtedly one of those feminists on our campus, he said wryly. In the age where women are clearly making themselves visible on all fronts, I, an Asian American woman, am still functioning as a front for those feminists, and am therefore invisible. Invisibility of women of color in the feminist movement is as relevant today as was at the dawn of the movement. If feminism is to succeed, it needs to destroy the stereotype that feminism is for white women by calling out white feminism when it occurs and striving for intersectionality. If feminism wants to succeed at its goals of ending oppression, it needs to tackle all the systems of oppression as they all intersect with one another, making removing one without removing all the others along with it basically impossible. Feminism today is a movement that not many people understand, but in fact, they need to educate themselves on. Not only is the feminist movement a movement to fight for women's rights, but it's also a movement that instills the idea that everyone deserves a fighting chance and that things should not be taken away nor denied from someone based on race, sex, or gender. The book presented to you today, This Bridge Called My Back, by Sherry Moraga and Gloria Anzadula, is a good place to start if you are looking for more information on the topic.